does the less admirable traits or tendencies in pietism, namely, first, an escapist mentality. It puts the emphasis, he says, on blessedness in the hereafter rather than justice for all here and now. Secondly, a certain anti-intellectual atmosphere. And thirdly, a, a pronounced tendency towards sectarian fragmentation. Steffler's right to point to these tendencies in pietism, or, but he clearly does not think that they're inevitable or intrinsic traits of a pietist orientation. And he's right about that. As I read, for example, Carl Henry's 1947 Jeremiah, The Uneasy Conscience of Modern Fundamentalism, really a great book. I see Henry as focusing on, he was right, uh, I see Henry as focusing on these very traits. Henry clearly condemns the escapist mentality that had come to dominate the evangelical mood in the post-World War II generation. He also worried much about a lack of nuanced evangelical engagement with the important intellectual issues of the day. And he certainly also regretted the separatistic patterns that had produced a fragmented evangelical movement. Henry was joined in looking for remedies to these defects by Harold John Ockengay, who wrote an introduction to Henry's book in which he emphasized the same concerns, particularly on the point of countering the fragmentation of evangelicalism. It's no ac accident that Ockengay and others who founded the National Association of Evangelicals around that time chose to name the association's magazine United Evangelical Action a motif that also came to characterize Billy Graham's uh, program of cooperative evangelism. Steffler's list of the defective tendencies that often plague pietism, uh, escapism or otherworldliness, anti-intellectualism, and uh, sectarian fragmentation, that's an important list. Indeed, I spent a good part of my own participation in the evangelical movement working to remedy those defects. It's still an important agenda today, even though the defective tendencies and the attempted correctives may show up in new ways in our present context. Having said all of that, I have to immediately add that it would be a very bad move to try to remedy those defects by moving to a completely opposite direction. We don't correct anti-intellectualism as Christians simply by slipping into a thoroughgoing rationalism, nor is an uncritical accommodation to the dominant culture patterns of the day a proper attitude to otherworldliness or antidote to otherworldliness. And then anything goes, ecumenism isn't the right way to counter a spirit of separatism. In saying that, I'm affirming what I consider to be the spirit of a proper sort of pietism. Our intellectual lives, our cultural engagements, our relationships with others in the body of Christ, all of these must be guided by a personal and communal holiness, by hearts that desire the kind of holiness without which none shall see the Lord. I do want to dig a little deeper, though, in explaining why I want to insist on the priority of piety, of the religion of the heart, that in turn must then give direction to our heads and to our hands. Actually, there's, there's some doctrinalists who make it clear that they're not opposed to seeing the heart as the primary locus of religious faith. Rather, they insist that the pietist is misusing the word heart. This comes out very clearly, for example, in some comments made by Elizabeth Clark George, the daughter of the late evangelical philosopher Gordon Clark in a published reminiscence of her father's anti-pietist anti orientation. She takes note of what she sees as what she calls the aggravatingly careless use of the terms heart and head, which are tossed about in Christian conversation today. What many people don't realize, she says, is that properly speaking, when people disparage the head, they are actually denouncing the heart. Since heart is not superior to the mind, this is quoting her now, the heart is the mind. And she continues, I quote, The mind is not dry, dull, and spiritually detached, nor does the heart produce some emotional frill 
that supposedly substantiates salvation. The head and the heart are synonyms. Regenerate in some people, unregenerate in others, and out of the abundance thereof the mouth speaketh. End quote. Now, needless to say, the real issue here often gets clouded by some unfortunate rhetoric on both sides. Uh, Elizabeth George reports, for example, that many evangelicals accused her father of all head, no heart, even intending thereby to call his own eternal salvation into question. They claim he wasn't a real Christian because he was too much head. She, in turn, finds it easy to dismiss those who want to posit a distinction between heart and head as grounding their salvation in some emotional thrill. My own reading of this kind of rhetorical exchange is that Clark was rightly reacting against the kind of less admirable traits that, as Steffler shows, often show up in pietism, especially the unnuanced anti-intellectualism. At the same time, however, Clark's insistence on the merging, the, the synonymity of heart and mind, has to be challenged from the perspective of theological reflection on the nature of the human person and the interaction of human faculties within the person. John Calvin, for one, clearly refused to conflate mind and heart. Calvin takes it as obvious, and I'm quoting and paraphrasing here, that faith is much higher than human understanding, such that it will not be enough for the mind to be illuminated by the Spirit of God unless the heart is also strengthened and supported by God's power. Calvin insists that those philosophers and theologians, and I'm quoting, go completely astray, who in considering faith identify it with a bare and simple assent arising out of knowledge, and they leave out the confidence and the assurance of the heart. The Word of God, Calvin writes, is not received by faith if it flits about in the top of the brain. It must enter into the depths of the heart so that the intellect's real understanding is illuminated by the Spirit of God who serves as a seal. These are his words. Spirit of God who serves as a seal to seal up in our hearts those very promises of certainty of which it has previously impressed upon our minds. Well, we can apply that to John Wesley's account of what happened at Aldersgate. He had for a long time given intellectual assent to truths of the gospel, but when as a result of his heart being strangely warmed, he could testify now, these are his words, that an assurance was given to me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. The Spirit had taken truths that had previously been presented only to Wesley's mind and now brought about what Calvin describes as the, the sealing up operation in the depths of uh, Wesley's heart. When I was engaged in doctoral studies in philosophy at the University of Chicago in the mid-1960s, one of the hot topics for those of us addressing issues in what we then call philosophy of mind was the whole question of minds and machines. Could a computer ever come to the point in its operations that we would say that it was actually capable of thinking? Could such a computer so closely approximate human patterns of reasoning that we would have to decide that the computer had a mind? Some philosophers had no problem with the idea of a thinking machine, since they had a rather low uh, kind of naturalistic, reductionistic view of, of the human person. One rather flippant way in which some of them put it at the time was that human beings are simply machines that happen to be made out of meat. Others, however, were concerned to maintain the uniqueness of the human person by insisting on a qualitative difference. I was listening to NPR the other night, driving in the Chicago area and they did a thing on animal consciousness. And it was the same kind of split. Some, some thinkers saying, yeah, animals and human beings, we're, we're all conscious. There's no real qualitative difference. And others saying, yeah, there's a kind of consciousness that you find in animals, but, but it isn't really that kind of consciousness. It, it, an animal can never have a ki kind of consciousness as a human being. The argument went back and forth. Others were concerned to maintain the uniqueness of the human person by insisting on a qualitative difference, an unbridgeable metaphysical gap 
between human minds and the bearers of so-called artificial intelligence. What both sides of the debate agreed upon, however, is that what fundamentally defines the human person is rationality, with the only important question being whether the human kind of rational intelligence could ever be replicated in a computer. I was always uneasy about that shared assumption that the real issue is rationality. And the grounds of my uneasiness became clear to me when I got around to seeing Stanley Kubrick's 1968 film, 2001, A Space Odyssey. In it, the crew members of a Jupiter space mission rely on the deliverances of a computer that they have named HAL. Now, there's no question that HAL, as depicted in the film, is highly intelligent. But what's important, more important for me, is the fact that HAL is devious. He rebels against his crew, and he plots their demise. Again, that's science fiction. But as such, it provides an important insight. A, a computer would finally come close to being like us, I want to argue. Not simply in, be able, in being able to think like us, but in having the capacity to elicit trust and to betray that trust. To put it in explicitly biblical terms, it was not so much Hal's capacity for rational understanding that made him so human-like, but rather that he was the kind of entity to which one could legitimately preach, trust in the Lord in all thine heart, and lean not on your own understanding. Lean not on your own understanding. To cut to the chase, the heart, in the biblical sense, is the place where we form our fundamental trustings, it's where we set the direction of our lives. We're either devoting our whole being toward obedience to God, or we're rebels against God. We're either covenant keepers or covenant breakers. The Dutch theologian Harry Kiter once put this nicely with a reference to the biblical understanding of the image of God. And I quote, To be like God, to be his image, is not something we can simply do by being rational creatures, or by having a good will. We can't see God in man while man stands still. To look like God has to do with the purpose God has for human beings. The question then is, what are human beings for? What is our calling? What are we here for? We're here to reflect God, to reflect God the covenant partner, to be God's image means simply that we as human beings are to live as covenant partners with God and with our fellow human beings on earth, end quote. It's in the heart where the capacity to function as covenant partners resides. And this, as I see it, is the kind of view of the human person, the, the theological anthropology that provides the basis for understanding pietism at its best. As sinners, our hearts are the seed of our rebellion against God. Only the Holy Spirit can enter into that most intimate place of being. Uh, Abraham Kuyper has a wonderful meditation uh, where he likens the, uh, the human person to uh, the, the tabernacle in the Old Testament. There's the outer court. That's where we do our public business. There's the holy place. That's our intimate relations with friends and spouses and lovers. And, and then he says there's the holy of holies. And, uh, and, and that's where we enter alone into the presence of our God. That's the heart region, that most intimate of all places. And the Holy Spirit, only the Holy Spirit can enter into that most intimate place of our being, the place in which our most fundamental trustings are formed and direct our thoughts and actions anew toward the service of the living God. How we pursue our doctrinal reflections and our, our efforts at cultural engagement then will depend on the condition of the hearts out of which our thoughts and our actions flow. Well, having briefly set forth that way of seeing things, I want now to look more closely at the relationship of piety to both doctrine and to cultural engagement. And first, some thoughts about the relationship of piety to doctrine. What I'm going to say about this, piety and doctrine, will make some evangelicals nervous. So it's important that I begin with some appeals to the authority to three of my heroes, all theologians with impeccable orthodox credentials, each of them a staunch defender of historic Calvinism. If you don't like me, you don't like them either. 